Hello everybody. Uh, today we're going to have a look at a um, kind of an unusual old vintage amp. This is a 1968 or 69 uh, plush P1000S amplifier. Uh, this, this amp is all tube, um, I believe, by the look of it. Um, just a cursory research online indicates uh, some people believe this to be a copy of a Fender Dual Showman. Um, I don't know how accurate that is. I was unable to find a schematic for this plush. However, I do have a schematic uh, that I believe is going to work for us, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a bit. Uh, but here, let me turn this um, head around. I also have the 215 cabinet uh, to go with it that matches with the red plush material, and you can see it's got this really kind of uh, dandy old plush it's kind of like a old lounge chair or something but this is all a vinyl uh, real sparkly vinyl totally totally late 60s early 70s and it's in um, its design sensibilities for sure uh, we can see here there was once upon a time an outlet um, that has been removed a couple missing screws that hold the the back plate on but they're kind of unnecessary considering every single one of these also holds that plate on so um, not a huge loss uh, that's kind of what we can see from the outside um, one other thing we can see we have four big 6L6 uh, power tubes over here in this section and the one two three four five six seven preamp tubes for a total of 11 tubes yeah so we have 11 tubes in this amp uh, a lot of tubes, huge transformers by the look of it. I uh, haven't popped the back off quite yet, but uh, I can see them poking through back there, and they look pretty enormous. Um, so yeah, let's take the let's take the doors off this thing and uh, see what we've got on the inside. Okay, just popping the tube guard back door off here, we can see we have what looks like, and all these look to be labeled on the chassis. I don't think there's original labels, but it does say uh, 7025, a 7025. Uh, ECC 81, which is also a 12 AT7, uh, 7025 here, uh, ECC 83, which is just your standard 12 AX7, uh, ECC 81 again, which is a 12 AT7, and another ECC 83. Um, over here, actually, not instead of 6L6s, we have 5881 WXTs, uh, which I believe these are made by Softec. Uh, we can get a little better look at the transformers through here. Um, and the transformers actually do say plush sound on them. So they were either made by plush or they were made exclusively for plush. I'll have to look up the, uh, uh, the numbers on those uh, to get a better idea of what the, what the story was with that. But uh, they do say plush sound on the bells. Um, back here says plush sound incorporated, New York, New York. We have reverb, uh, input and output. We have a reverb pedal, vibrato pedal, a recording output, and outputs for slave amplifiers, um, which allows you to uh, tap into the junction where everything mixes together, where you get your, uh, your tremolo, your first and second channels, um, your reverb, and it all mixes together. I believe that is the case here. That's what it looks like on the schematic that I'm going to use, uh, what happens here. Uh, we have a main speaker out and an external speaker out. Um, also a standby switch, and I've learned from experience, uh, at least on this one, the stand standby switch needs to be in the up position to be on. Kind of confused me at first. We have a 2.5 amp slow blow fuse, um, and... Uh, that's what we can see from the back. Now let's go ahead and uh, pop the bottom door off and take a look at that. Yeah, as I mentioned, this amp does have a bottom door, uh, which allows you to get to the guts. Um, there are two screws um, that hold it in, but frankly, you don't even need the screws because the sheer uh, friction of the of the plush of the vinyl on vinyl on the inside here kind of keeps the door on um, just on its own. Not not very easy to get to. You really kind of need to get a screwdriver or something in here to, to pry this thing up. So let's um, let me put down the camera here and uh, and get it up for us, and we'll take a closer look. Okay, here we are with the bottom panel up and off. 
uh, we can see that we have a reverb tank here. Um, the bottom panel, at least, is made of some sort of uh, some sort of fiberboard. Um, someone has already been in the amp and serviced it. Um, we can see it's got a couple spray atoms here. Um, this will certainly be a new component. Um, looks like we have a lot of new spray atoms. It looks like every uh, every single cap in the amp was changed to spray atoms. These big orange drops are probably original. Uh, looks like a couple of these uh, resistors, and I'm not sure exactly where we are in the uh, in the amp at this point, but we've got some resistors that have been changed out. So yeah, this thing has been pretty extensively serviced at some point, probably in the not too distant past. Uh, we do see some inspection marks here, um, and those have. Those have dates associated with them by the look of it. You could probably even nail this down to a particular uh, guy or gal on the assembly line if you wanted to uh, who did those certain things. You can see here the old electrolytic uh, cap can has been completely removed from the circuit. Um, and now there are wires running over here to these rails. Um, there are also some wires running uh, inside the amp, which we will have to look at. Uh, there are a couple more, a couple more uh, elect big electrolytics there. Um, over here in this area, it looks like our all of our. I'm assuming these are grid stoppers um, on these output tubes. They look like they are all new. Those resistors. Um, so yeah, pretty extensively service this amp, uh, but what it is doing, uh, it's actually making some popping noises uh, whenever you hit low notes and th just the sheer um, movement of, of the cabinet underneath it is causing it to kind of crackle and, and pop and, and things. So I'm going uh, try to try to fiddle with this and maybe turn it on do some chop sticking around in the circuit and see what component or components <laughs> are causing that to happen. You can actually you can actually tap on the head when it's when it's on and it makes a <laughs> kind of a sound. So uh, we need to try to track that down. Let's go ahead and pull the entire chassis out of the thing and uh, get a get a little closer look. Still, okay. Here we are with the chassis out of the cabinet, and uh, we can see everything a little more clearly here. Uh, here we have what uh, what is most definitely a new power rail um, with the new power resistors and the whole shebang over here. Uh, all of these again are sprays. Now these look like they're uh, rated at uh, these say these say 20 microfarads at um, 500 volts. And I'll have to check the schematic that I suspect uh, might be the same. Um, and again, and I'm not sure why they have these stickers over these. Um, but we'll, we'll check into that and see what's going on there. Maybe I can put, uh, put a meter on them and get some sort of measurement. Not sure why the sticker is there. But it does have, um, it does look like someone may have been going by the same schematic that I have. Because uh, these are the labels for each node of the the power rail um, I don't know maybe not actually that looks like maybe an A uh, C or D don't know for sure um, but we will check that out and see what's going on but uh, that's definitely all new work there um, and it's not badly done uh, by the look of it um, we can see the input jacks all have are, are all grounded which is nice I um, don't know whether you can see that or not, but yeah, the input input jacks are all grounded. Uh, on this amp, you have two channels, and these are the controls for the first channel that are on top of the chassis there. Uh, the controls uh, for the second channel are underneath, um, which kind of kind of is a pain in the butt, to be honest. Um, I don't like that very much because anytime you um, 
you know, if you're searching for problems, especially that can that's going to be a pain in the butt to kind of have to flip this chassis over every time I want to go between channel one and channel two to test things out. But um, but that's what we have to deal with. Here is the uh, big power power transformer, and it is labeled uh, plush sound. I'm not sure if you can see that. We're upside down from it right now. And we can see there, plush sound, uh, PT1000. Uh, the model of the amp is um, is a P1000, so that's power transformer uh, for 1000. And I'm assuming they did that to keep to keep it straight in their own inventory. And then they've got a got a number after that. <clears throat> um, this one is also labeled plush sound. That looks like a little choke here. Uh, here is an Here's the output transformer that we looked at before. It's labeled plush sound. Um, this little guy here is labeled plush sound as well. I'm not sure if that's the output transformer or that might be the choke actually. And this, I uh, know, excuse me, this is the output transformer of course. This um, may be in the reverb circuit. Uh, we'll take a look and see what's up with this one. Uh, but I think what, that's what we have. We have a power transformer, a choke, a, an output transformer and I think this is uh, in the reverb circuit but we'll, we'll get a better look at that in just a moment. Let's flip this thing over and uh, look at the underneath side. Well, Here's the underneath side. I've just kind of flipped it up on its edge here. We've already seen this side of course uh, when we took the bottom door off but now we can get a slightly better look uh, without, uh, without parts of the chassis in the way and we can see that the pots uh, appear to be and excuse the focusing uh, once again um, but the pots all appear to be 1968, uh, 37th week on that one, uh, the 40th week there on that one, 1968. Um, and they all seem to be pretty much bunched in that sort of time frame, uh, from what I can see, at least. Um, so I'll, that's what I think we're looking at here, a really late 1968, uh, perhaps early 1969. Uh, example and uh, I'm gonna fire this thing up and see if I can't poke around and figure out uh, what the problem is and uh, we'll, we'll take a look okay at that. I've only just gotten this thing opened up and I've actually left it um, left it tilted in the upright position so uh, we can demonstrate uh, what's going on here um, one of the one of the, practically one of the first things I've done here is just kind of wiggled some tubes and um, I can already tell um, as I tap on each of the output tubes these first two seem okay. Uh, this one, however, that's coming through the output, the speaker. So, and the same thing is happening when I tap on this one as well. So, tapping on either of those last two tubes um, pr actually reproduces the problem that I'm experiencing. So, what I'm going to do is come over here and. Uh, and actually wiggle some wires and wiggle these resistors that are uh, soldered to the sockets on those two tubes and those are all new as well so there's a good chance that whoever uh, whoever replaced those resistors um, has maybe maybe mis soldered something uh, so we're gonna come in there and take a look at what's going on and see if we can't isolate it and uh, we'll be right okay, back. Okay, I think I've isolated exactly what the problem is, and it's not those tubes after all. Um, it is it is something uh, close to them, but it's not them. Uh, you remember we spoke about the removal of this uh, CAN capacitor from the circuit. Um, well, when you reach around and you just touch or wiggle that the physical CAN, you are able to reproduce the problem and the, the the reason you're able to reproduce the problem is every all these components including the bias circuit for those output tubes um, they are all grounded uh, right here with the grounds of the the can capacitor uh, so this is kind of a lesson here um, whenever we remove these can capacitors we have to make sure that if we solder any new components to them that we're not desoldering the actual can itself from the chassis otherwise uh, we're going to end up with this sort of problem uh, where the the can itself can be moved around and that is actually causing the ground um, to be intermittent 
Um, and that is most definitely the problem. And what I'm going to have to do is come in here uh, with some uh, blobs of solder and solder in these, uh, these twists uh, which hold this old can capacitor in. We're just going to leave this can capacitor in, but we're going to come in here and do a better job of soldering this to the chassis so we don't get that intermittent popping. Uh, and that's what's been happening. Uh, as the amp itself has been rumbling, moving around physically, um, that has been decoupling uh, the, these little joints here from the chassis, and so we're getting intermittent intermittent uh, grounding. So that that's a that's actually kind of a neat lesson uh, for anyone who does this sort of work uh, to remember when you solder or desolder things from ground. Uh, that sometimes if it's if it's two components that you're relying on uh, for this ground connection, uh, that that could become intermittent uh, so you have to make sure that those are really nice and tight uh, so we're going to come in here with some with some solder and fix that up and see if that doesn't take care of our problem before we do that um, before we go in there and solder that connection this might be a good time to take a look at the schematic or what I believe to be a very very close schematic this is um, this is a schematic from a company called uh, earth sound uh, it's actually Earth Sound Research, and they uh, were the successor company, I, I believe, uh, from what little research I've done online. I think Earth uh, came out of the ashes of plush, um, and this is their G2000 Super Guitar Amplifier, and I believe it to be a very close equivalent of what I have here, uh, this plush P1000S. Uh, at the very least, this amp can be, or this schematic rather, can be used uh, as a substitute uh, for the plush schematic. I think the only difference you're going to find is that uh, this little transistor here is replaced by a tube in the plush design. Um, I believe that to be accurate. Now, uh, I, I haven't had both of these amps. Uh, back to back, and I haven't found any transistors that I that I can see right off the bat inside this plush. So my assumption is because we ha only have ten tubes in this design, whereas we have uh, we counted eleven tubes in this plush design. So I'm thinking that that eleventh tube uh, is is doing this job that this transistor is doing in the other. Uh, and and essentially what that is, that's the point in the circuit where our channel 1, our normal channel comes through. Uh, right here, our second vibrato channel also comes through and uh, hooks up at this point, as well as our reverb is also coming through and eventually uh, hooking up at this point. Our tremolo also, uh, here's our intensity for tremolo. It's also hooking in at this point, so pretty much everything uh, is being mixed together right here. Here's our mix, uh, and it is take it is coming out of uh, this little transistor on this design and going to the output for our slave amps. So there's our slave amps output. Um, so you know if you're not using the slave amps feature uh, it's not going to matter uh, these are essentially the exact same uh, guitar amplifiers from what I can tell so at least every everything in the power section that I've gone through so far uh, has been uh, pretty close or identical I haven't gone through the entire schematic um, but this is the one you need if you're trying to service a plush uh, P1000S um, and they made these from about 1968 to I think about 1974 so um, I'm sure there are quite a few of them out there and, and I, I was unable to find uh, a schematic um, but this is the one you need uh, Earth Sound Research uh, Super Guitar G2000 this is your schematic and like I said the only other difference uh, appears to be that a tube is doing this job so um, so there you so there's that and hopefully that's helpful for someone okay uh, what I've done now um, just to illustrate what's been done I've come in here with um, with a bunch of solder um, soldered these connections to the chassis uh, just a little better uh, also have hooked them together um, with wires 
and uh, hooked them to a more secure ground uh, from this point over here. Um, this ground actually is uh, screwed in and it uh, seems, seems pretty secure so um, that should be much much better. Now let's take a look um, and a listen and see if that has solved our problem. Okay, here we have the amp uh, back plugged in, back on, uh, standing upright so that we can um, illustrate uh, our point. Uh, if we shine back here to the tubes um, and we tap on the ones that were making the noise, they no longer make the noise. Furthermore, we can tap on the, uh, the can capacitor. Uh, we can wiggle it every direction we want and it no longer is making the inter intermittent noise. So I think we've solved that problem. Um, I think we may have also had a slight problem with the reverb, so I'm gonna uh, see if we can troubleshoot that. But more or less, we can, um, we can button this thing up. Now before we do, um, I may also um, take a look at the cabinet with you here, and uh, we'll at least just see. I've actually got the thing out and open anyway, so we can take a look and see. Um, now the Utah speakers, that were original to the cab um, are both burnt. Um, they are showing, you know, no, no um, uh, open leads rather on um, on both of those speakers uh, when you try to test them for continuity. So they're they have burnt voice coils for sure. Uh, but we can at least take a look at what they look like and um, to also take a look at what I'm replacing. Now, them before with. we move along to looking at the cabinet, uh, I just wanted to discuss one thing uh, very quickly that's uh, worthy of discussion on these old vintage amps, uh, and that is grounding issues resulting from uh, bad connections on grounded inputs. Uh, now what can what can sometimes happen is if you have one of these grounded input connections which is not getting good contact right here uh, see this element or this this connection rather this contact uh, and this contact need to maintain contact um, if if we are to uh, have a have an input which is grounded when not in use. Um, when the input is in use, there is a contact that is made right here at this point, and what that does is it, it grounds the, uh, the input so that there's no noise coming through. If those contacts are dirty, um, if, they're, uh, if they're bent and they're not getting good contact, um, they will produce all sorts of noise on the channel that you're not using, even when the, the volume is all the way down. Uh, very often they'll produce noise. Uh, so a good way to, to determine whether or not you're getting good contact and a good way to fix problems uh, if, you're, um, if you suspect you're not getting good contact there, um, like this one wasn't, um, then you can actually uh, input a cord into the jack and you can watch very closely uh, these two contacts. Now if, if this inner contact which goes to ground, if this one moves at all whenever you plug in a jack, in, a, in other words if it moves outward like you see right there as I'm pushing in it's kind of moving outward with uh, with the tip connection they're, they're moving together somewhat before they separate now you can see there they're separate now if I release the jack you can see that they do indeed touch at one point um, and the, the this one is actually physically moving this one so you can actually see that it's it is making a physical connection uh, now what what you can also do to ensure they're getting good connection is plug a jack in so you get a little space in between and you can take a piece of um, just regular sandpaper uh, somewhat fine grit uh, you don't need real rough sandpaper like 180 or 80 or 220 um, actually even 320 is probably uh, just a bit rough but um, something like 600 or 1000 grit may work slightly better um, but just to demonstrate what you can do you can take a sliver of sandpaper like this and you can go um, into the it's gonna be kinda hard to do and film but let me, uh, let me see if I can do that for you uh, you come in here and uh, in between the two contacts and you just and you just rub that sandpaper in between the two this way and then you flip it over 
and come back the other way and rub it through a few times and that's gonna kind of burnish the contacts a bit uh, and ensure that <laughs> ensure that you get good connection uh, and then when you're done doing that uh, you can come through with a little bit of contact cleaner spray them uh, I'm gonna go ahead and spray both of these and um, that's going to ensure that you, from now on, uh, get good connection. So that's just one thing I wanted to talk about. This this um, this amp needs all the help it can get in terms of uh, quieting it down somewhat, especially on this first channel because all of the controls are up top. So all of the cords running uh, running underneath from these controls. Uh, are a little bit longer so they're generating more noise and to complicate matters even worse there uh, none of these wires are shielded um, so you know any little bit of, of stray RF signal is going to be picked up uh, by these wires that are leading in and they're going to be amplified throughout the circuit so um, any little bit that you can do uh, to try to clean these up and make sure that uh, you get as little noise as possible, the better off we're going to be. And another thing that you um, really need to do is uh, come over to the jacks. <clears throat> and uh, if if nothing else, let me get some light going here so we can see. Um, come over with the jacks and actually, uh, actually loosen them up a little bit uh, just to the point where you get a little bit of a gap. You get a little bit of a gap in between, and then you can come in here um, and spray spray underneath there as well to ensure that um, uh, when you tighten that back down, uh, you're going to get a decent ground connection because this is where your ground, your inputs are being grounded is, is on the chassis there. So uh, in order to help make sure that we're getting good connection, it helps every now and then to loosen your jacks and then spray them and then uh, tighten them back down to make sure that uh, you get uh, any and all corrosion um, uh, off of there and that, that's going to help you keep those grounded so that, that's one thing I wanted to talk about before we moved on um, because this is a bit of a noisy amp and another thing as well uh, I wanted to show uh, is the noise um, coming from this first channel. Again, all of the leads coming from channel one have to go a little bit further. And I'm gonna demonstrate that uh, Okay, right now. we're back here and the amp is on. Um, all the controls across the board are all turned all the, all the way down, completely down. And we're getting very, very little noise. In fact, you can barely hear a barely audible hum. Uh, so that's good. Uh, we can turn up channel one. And it does, and you know, it does give us a little more hum, just to let us know it's there. And we can actually crank channel one all the way up. Now we're actually getting a lot more noise because uh, we're on the we're on the basement floor here, so. So we're getting a little bit more noise than we should be getting. Uh, there's no shielding underneath or, or anything of that sort. So, um, so that's helping to generate a little more noise than normal too. Um, but just to demonstrate channel one and kind of how noisy it is, and we're going to see if we can um, if we can fix that. But if I take the controls to channel one and I turn them all the way up, uh, we can see once we get everything all the way up to ten. It actually goes. It actually goes into a sort of an oscillation, um, which usually is an indication that we've got a lot of noise uh, somewhere uh, in that channel. So we're going to go in and see if we can't um, kind of quieten things down a okay, little bit. Okay, uh, we're back with the amp, and um, what I've done here is I've actually ran shielded cables uh, from both inputs, uh, from this input, which is channel two. Uh, and also channel 1 input and you can see the shielded cable going through the hole here uh, up to channel 2 or to channel 1 rather uh, both shielded cables have been run along the edge of the chassis 
and uh, each of them is going to their respective inputs. Uh, running the shielded cable has made it possible to crank up all of the controls on both of the channels uh, with nothing plugged in and now I get no sorts of oscillations. Um, you recall just a moment ago we demonstrated that turning all of the inputs all the way up uh, created oscillation um, and we're going to do that on channel one again here and you'll see that it doesn't do that anymore. Um, so bass, middle, treble all the way up, volume is now all the way up, it doesn't cut out and it also doesn't oscillate. Uh, so that has been remedied and I think we're pretty much ready to go with this thing. Uh, let's take a look at the uh, cabinet. Here's the cabinet lying uh, with its back down on the floor. I'm actually installing some new speakers. Uh, in order to install these speakers the holes actually have to be uh, widened out somewhat. Um, without doing this um, normal speakers uh, won't fit. I don't know if um, the Utah speakers that were in here are some sort of special order um, or that if that's the only thing they could get to fit in their cabs um, but I've tried several different 15 inch speakers uh, trying to get them to fit the original uh, hole size and it was a it was about probably um, a quarter inch or to a half an inch uh, too thin all the way around for the speakers to sit all the way down inside so um, I've actually widened out the holes for both so that now we can fit any standard 15 inch speaker we want um, and we're not limited uh, anymore so uh, but this gives you a decent look at what the cab is like um, now this cabinet is one of the few that had the that originally had the badge um, on the grill up here the badge is gone that, that used to say plush but the piece of wood is still here uh, this is the grill with the three uh, three little portholes in it to match up with those portholes. Kind of a cool cab and a cool looking setup when it's all uh, when it's all set up. Let's take a look at the uh, original speakers. Here's a look one. at one of the original Utah 15 inch speakers uh, that came in the cabinet, uh, both of which were blown. Um, these have several uh, several different codes on them. Uh, only one of them corresponds to the date. Um, this one, 328, uh, would be Utah. The number 9 is 1969, uh, 33rd week of 1969. So the cabinet uh, is for sure a 1969 cabinet. And um, e even though the head has some 1968 parts, I'm, I'm fairly certain that, it's, uh, that they were sold together. So it is a... Uh, it is a 1960-69. Um, this is a pretty hefty speaker. It's a shame that both of them blew. Um, but, uh, but they are indeed both, both blown. But what I usually do in a situation like this, um, I save these original speakers. Uh, I'll pass them along to the new owner of this amp. And uh, if they want to restore these and have them reconed, um, you know, usually it's not economical to do that uh, with with old Utahs, but um, if they want them, if they want this amp uh, more original uh, with the original speakers, then they'll be able to do that. But uh, so that'll be passed along. But yeah, that is um, that's the amp and the guts and the schematic. Now let's uh, take a listen. To what it says. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank <laughs> you. 